right from the instance I left that road and get out in that field, the whole nine yards, I, it's etched up here forever. Where does Bigfoot come from, essentially? You know, I've heard a lot of, there's a lot of different ideas. Sasquatch are, or Bigfoot, are the descendants of Gigantopithecus. Jacob's heritage, which was smooth skin like us, and then the all hairy red man like uh, Esau was, if he in fact mixed with the giants, the Nephilim, you've got a, a, a being there, you know. I think, I think they're more closely related to us. I don't think they're a, um, I don't think they're a close relative, but I think they're more us than, than ape. So within the Bigfoot community, I'm what is known as an aper. We see something called a mid-tarsal break within these footprints that tells us that Sasquatch feet move like ape feet. You've gone from hundreds of years of collecting evidence to one data point that would go beyond evidence that would be proof. All right, so we're here with Grayson. Grayson, uh, how long have you believed in Bigfoot? And why do you believe in Bigfoot? I don't know if I do yet. I have a really big interest in it. Okay. Well, I guess it all started in childhood, growing up hunting and fishing, and just hear the stories, uh, you know, growing up around hunting camp and stuff. I used to hear callings because we sit at the fire at night. As everybody probably watched some of the shows and all in the past, I grew up in the 70s, so there was a lot of movies to watch. So I got out in the woods more, and then eventually I just had where there was more experiences, like noises and things you heard. Me and uh, the little woman was out in the woods one day, and uh, we found a footprint. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't that that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? What would I'd you say? say to read them? a book. Dang it, pick a book. <laughs> Almost any Bigfoot book. Uh, you know, there's some are better. Dr. Meldrum's book. Sasquatch or uh, Legend Meet Science, probably one of the better ones. But you know, for people to be so positive about something and not make any effort to study it, yeah. and I really don't care if they believe, but don't be so darn positive unless you're willing to read a book about it and study it. Because if you do any study, you're gonna find out there's a lot of good stories, uh, people that come like something like this, a lot of them got stories yeah. What happened to them? So, you know, don't, you know, I'm positive they're out there and all over the world, but I've been studying this for going on 14 years or something like that. So, yeah. What would you say to some people that maybe necessarily are haters or naysayers about the, about the topic? I mean, what do you, what do you kind of have to say to them? Well, first of all, uh, based on recent surveys, about 82% of the population does not think there's any chance that Bigfoot could exist. So only 18% of people think that it's even possible that this thing does exist. So uh, we are in a minority. So I understand why people think that it you know, probably doesn't exist, even though everybody loves the idea of Bigfoot. Yeah. I mean, it's a cultural icon. We love it's it in commercials, movies. Yeah. Uh, those little cutout things that people put in their yeah. yard now. Um, so what I, what I can tell people is that if you really delve into the material and immerse yourself in the evidence, it's actually pretty compelling when you combine thousands of eyewitness accounts that are very consistent, Native American legends all over the continent that talk about a big, hairy, wild man, um, the Patterson-Gimlin film, which is really the only really convincing film footage we have, the footprint evidence, there have been hundreds of casts made of footprint impressions that are very consistent, right. and things that look like Bigfoot actually did exist in the fossil record. They were yeah. called hominins, and for two million years in Africa, they were basically upright walking apes. They weren't as tall as Bigfoot. That's the only thing that doesn't really match up with the modern sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. So if you consider all of that, it's actually, in my opinion at least, that's a pretty compelling body of evidence that they do exist. What was kind of the first thing that got you interested in Bigfoot or UFO phenomenon, things like that? Back in 1973, there was a major UFO outbreak in this region, in the Glens Falls region, all the way down into uh, uh, you know, Pascagoula, Mississippi, uh, coin helicopter case in, in, in Ohio. And so we had this massive UFO flap. And up in Glen Lake, New York, there was something that landed 
at the La Cabana restaurant, the former La Cabana restaurant. And there's a famous photo of Jack Bergeron pointing to these two concentric circles that were sort of charred into his, his uh, driveway, his dirt driveway. Uh, the hot water taps in the restaurant ran cold and the cold water taps ran hot for about three weeks following the incident. So it was a very interesting uh, UFO experience and I became very interested in the UFO phenomena from that. And then in 1976, we had a major Bigfoot incident on Bear Road in rural Whitehall, New York. And I became interested in the Bigfoot phenomena because now it wasn't in the Pacific Northwest. The phenomena was right here in our, our backyards. So we found out that there was a rich history and often underlooked in this region of uh, stone giants, wendigos, various, you know, Samuel Champlain talked about the goo goo. So we have various uh, historical data for the creature in this area. So in 73 and 76 is when I became involved in this type of research. We kind of wanted to take a little bit of a deeper dive and figure out kind of, you know, how you started to believe in Bigfoot. Um, you know, where that's taken you so far, what your experiences have been. So I guess that would be my first question. When did you kind of first believe in Bigfoot? Um, UFOs kicked in at about five. Bigfoot was probably between seven and eight okay. years of age. And uh, my, first, my first experience with it was um, pretty much seeing a, a photographic still from the Patterson Gimlin film. Right. In a, in a library book. And um, I don't know, it just, it, nothing ever looked fake about it to me. And then flash forward to uh, uh, 1977, that would have put me at 12 years old, uh, in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Um, they actually showed the Patterson Gimlin film in its, you know, 36 second entirety or whatever it was, maybe 56 seconds. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, oh, that's a guy in a costume. And when I looked at it, even though it was at the time that there was no stabilization or anything like that. So what you saw was literally him jumping off the horse, running, trying to find some place to prop the camera up and then finally get a, a couple of seconds of steady camera footage. Um, there was just never anything about it that to me did not look organic. It, it just always felt true to me. You know, I mean, I get somebody looking at something. I mean, you see stuff on YouTube all the time and there are things that feel organic to me and they, those make me take pause and say, well, I want to dig a little deeper into this. Um, and then there's others that's like, no, come on. This, this, you know, somebody, yeah, somebody's, yeah. somebody's playing a hoax here. Um, so, you know, it, it, the fact, the fact that I, I feel myself as a, a relatively intelligent person, well-educated, um, and not prone to fantasies or yeah. um, making up crazy ideas, I kind of had to believe myself, believe my own gut that there was something honest and true about it. My first encounter with Bigfoot was on Prospect Mountain in the Lake George area of New York. Um, I was there on the off season early uh, April and I was with a, a research partner of mine and you know at the time we were really just two friends out hiking um, we weren't you know full blown researchers yet but we're walking down the road it's about six o'clock in the evening and I said hey let's practice our Sasquatch calls so you know we start woo, you know going off with our calls and something starts answering us which was really incredible so that went on for about 15 minutes um, and then we got the heck out of there because we were scared um, now if that happened to me I would have stuck around to see what it was but I think that that was probably a Sasquatch and what validated that were my experiences in Oregon when I was studying there for four months under some really amazing researchers, one of which is my research partner today. So out in Oregon, we were in the Mount Hood National Forest in an area that there had been a ton of sightings. People were casting footprints. Um, you know, this research group I was studying under was yielding a lot of evidence out of this area. And so they brought me along to show me. Uh, we were driving down old logging roads where we heard some incredible vocalizations. And I also had an experience where we heard some rock clacking coming from the tree line. And then all of a sudden I heard an ape-like grunt and smelled this very pungent ape-like odor. So I've had a few experiences out there 
but perhaps the most um, amazing experience I had was seeing one in the middle of the night. Uh, it was uh, almost midnight and we were out on private property that we had um, exclusive access to. And, you know, we're walking around, all of a sudden we hear cracking and crunching and, you know, quietly, but it was definitely there. Something was walking through the woods. And before I knew it, I'm staring into the tree line. The moonlight is beautiful and bright. You could see kind of in between each tree. And I see this huge man-like figure step between two trees, kind of look at us, and then walk off. It was the most incredible experience. And at the time I thought, there's no way that could have been a Sasquatch because it was too big. Yeah. And afterwards we measured, it was about seven and a half foot, which puts it in the range of an adult male Sasquatch. But you know, in the moment you just, you can't imagine the size of them until you see one yourself. Where does Bigfoot come from essentially? You know, I've heard a lot of, there's a lot of different ideas. Um, I'm not as educated in, in, in Bigfoot. Um, I mean, what is Bigfoot? I've heard people that say it's an ape. I've heard people that say it's a mammal. People that say it's even a, a branch of human, of, of Neanderthal. Well, what is Bigfoot? What is Bigfoot in the sense that there's a lot of people, because we don't have a specimen to study or to take genetic samples or any of that, the question is wide open. And so I would back up and I would say, our best guess for the moment is it's a primate like us because we are primates and I would just leave it at that because if you were to go further down the road or farther down the road it's just a guessing game if you were to say it's an ape part of the ape group part, part of the human species that's your guessing and I would say just just until that time comes the best answer is to say I don't know or more than likely, it's just a primate that's in the group that we're in. And that should be enough, you know? Yeah. I mean, if I were to take a picture of you 500 feet away and someone would say, okay, zero in on our shoes. Are those Nikes or New Balance or what? Yeah. And it's just like, I would say, I don't know, which, but it does look like he's wearing shoes. Yeah, okay. That's a, that, yeah, that's a fair answer. There's no doubt that Bigfoot is a polarizing topic. It's a topic that you either, it seems it's either loved or hated, um, but it's polarizing nonetheless. What, what is your view on what type of being Bigfoot is? There's some discussion that it's a, it's a man, um, some discussion that it's uh, more closely to an ape. What do you, where do you feel like you believe that Bigfoot kind of falls in line with? Over the 50 years of research I've done into this, because uh, I've done it from a very early age and met a lot of uh, uh, established researchers like uh, Brad Steiger and so forth, it's apparent to me that there's a connectivity between the phenomena in that uh, people that fall into one camp or the other I really don't care about that. It's a matter of how the evidence is presented and collected, and I don't care where it ends up, personally. And I think that there's definitely that these could be manifestations from the same source phenomena and we're all looking for that same source. I met Dr. Hynek years ago, the famous ufologist, and he gave a talk calling uh, UFOs a challenge to modern science. He was talking about parallel realities and it's very well that we may be uh, involved into some sort of parallel reality research here with the advent of quantum physics and, and talks like that, uh, this opens up lots of doors that may start to explain some of the more anomalous phenomena that don't seem to fit into natural, you know, flesh and blood, bone, uh, solid evidence. As far as, you know, what Bigfoot is, yeah, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge gap between apers and non-apers. Yeah. And I think when you start talking, um, when you start talking to and about the the people that are in this that are, are more science based, like the Meldrums and and the Cliff Barackmans right. and stuff, I think they tend to lean more towards them being a a more ape, more primate. Um, again, they've got that that science wall that they're leaning on. Right. And there's precedent for it, you know, with Giganopithecus and yeah. Homo florensis and, and all the other different variations of, of human hominid. I tend to 
I tend to pay a lot of attention to the Native American um, stories about these things. And if you look into it deep enough, you'll find that throughout history, they, their, their oral traditions show that they shared the land with these things mm -hmm. and that they, they struck deals with them and they, they traded food and, right. and, and other things. Um, so I, I think they're much more, my belief is they're much more closely related to us. You hear, you hear the mimic, they mimic different animals and yeah. you know, there's reports of people who have a dog and they're, hey Spot, hey Spot, hey Spot, you know, every night they call Spot to come back in the house and then they go out in the woods and they hear this voice out in the distance going, hey Spot, hey Spot. You know, well, they're they're mimicking, they're yeah. repeat. You know, what else would be doing it? I, I mean, I don't know, and yeah. you know that that's kind of creepy. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and and a lot of a lot of what they're said to be able to do seems to also relate to having mobile, yeah, mobile thumbs, yeah. mo opposable thumbs. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, to me that 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 puts them more in a category of being like us. Yeah. Are they? I don't know. It's, you know, I, I think it's easy to look at something that stands up on two legs, walks on two feet, and even though they might hunch over, their long arms might be longer, and their, their head is lower set on the neck, you still want to assign human attributes to it because it looks like it walks like us. Right. Um, if you watch a bear, a bear can walk upright. Yeah. But a bear doesn't have really long arms and it kind of waddles more than it has strides. And these things are said to have a very smooth stride to them, mm. almost to the point where they almost look like they're on roller skates or on skis because you don't see any kind of head bob mm. and it, it's just a very unnerving way that they move. So um, I, think, I think they're more closely related to us. I don't think they're a, um, I don't think they're a close relative, but I think they're more us than than ape. So within the Bigfoot community, I'm what is known as an aper, okay. which basically means that I am, if Bigfoot exists, I think it's a hominin, which is a great ape. Okay. And that has, it has, basically it has a similar locomotor system to us, that is it walks upright, primarily on its hind legs, which makes it look very human. But as far as the physical characteristics that are described, covered in hair, ape-like features, receding forehead, sagittal crest, powerfully built. It's an ape, and that's, that's my opinion. There's a little bit of uh, suspicion as to what Bigfoot actually is. So I have heard some people say that it is, uh, it's an ape. Some people say that it's uh, more closely to a man. I've ha heard some people say um, that it's even human. Um, what is your view on, on what kind of species Bigfoot is um, or what it closely would, would relate to? Well, evidence points us to the conclusion that Sasquatch or Bigfoot is an ape. Uh, there are three piece of, pieces of evidence that tell us this. Um, there are footprint casts, right, and those show unique anatomy in the form of midfoot flexibility. So we see something called a mid-tarsal break within these footprints that tells us that Sasquatch feet move like ape feet. We also have hair samples that are very close to human and also chimpanzees. And another thing we see is throughout these prints and also on windows and cars, um, Sasquatch hand fingerprints are left uh, and they're called dermal ridges. That's what scientists call them. So we see dermal ridges in hand and footprint casts as well as on windows after a Sasquatch has visited that area. So all of these things point to Sasquatch being an ape. They're also hair covered, they have forward facing eyes, and they have no tail, which describes an ape species. So whether they're closer to human or other great apes is still a mystery and we need more data to find out. Where do you believe <clears throat> Bigfoot comes from? I mean, what do you think Bigfoot is? I mean, there's a lot of speculation as to what Bigfoot as a, as a being is. Um, some believe he's an ape, some believe he's Part man, I mean, what, what do you personally believe? I do believe the best story that I have is uh, <clears> that they're biblical, actually. And okay. maybe I've mentioned to that Esau and the Edomites, mm -hmm. Genesis 25, uh, the twin brothers, um, when Rebecca was pregnant, uh, they fought. 
-hmm. And uh, she was told that she was going to be the mother of two nations. Mm -hmm. Well, this world has had multiple nations. But if you look at it in terms of Jacob's heritage, which was smooth skin like us, and then all hairy red man like uh, Esau was, if he in fact mixed with the giants, the Nephilim, you've got a, you've got a, a, a being there. You know, it's just, it's a biblical reference. It's no proof, but uh, just the same. I think it's a great possible heritage. Particularly if you believe in the Bible, there's yeah. some history there that you can believe, you know. Yeah. Of course, I've, we've attended the United Methodist Church since since we moved here, and and uh, I think that's, to me, that's the best explanation. Yeah, yeah. it's very it's particularly, interesting. Particularly when the dad said Esau would live away with from earth's blessings and he would live by the sword, and that describes Bigfoot right to a T. Hmm. You know, we, we really enjoy, you know, cake and ice cream and, and all the culture, all the, I mean, not the whole race does, but for most of us, we are so fortunate to have comfortable homes and right. and food and, you know, um, but, but if you had to live in a hole in the ground and uh, eat dry roots <laughs> yeah. or just leaves off the trees, yeah, uh, and be almost as smart, if not smarter, than us. Yeah, that'd be pretty sad. It's an interesting concept too. You know, yeah, if you yeah. look at you look yeah. at the book of Daniel, you know Nebuchadnezzar was sent out to essentially live like a bigfoot. Oh, did he? Oh, I, um, I missed yeah. It. There's a there, you should you should look into it. There's a story about um, he was essentially cursed by God, and uh, he went out for seven years. Oh, did it he? Says that his hair grew long, his nails grew long. Really? He, he I'm ate grass. Look at Daniel, yeah. no yeah. kidding. And then. Uh, and then after the seven years, he came back and was, he, he dedicated the rest of his life to, to living for the Lord. But oh, it's, an inter- it's an interesting concept. Well, the thing that, that uh, is interesting, if you look at several books of the Bible, they really, the writers really condemn the Edomites. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a big mm-hmm. fight uh, between the Edomites and the, and the chosen people, the, mm-hmm. the Jewish nation. Over the years, they really had a lot of fights. Um, in today's age, I think the the Bigfoot knows that we have terrible weapons, including a whole bunch of hunting weapons, you know, <laughs> that yeah. they better stay away from us because the average reaction is to start shooting, even when you only got a twenty two, you know, yeah. it's just stupid. Got an 800 pound monster and you yeah. shoot at him with a little tiny pea shooter and the people do that, you know, and that seems to be the natural reaction. And if he was actually threatening the person, that makes sense, but in many cases, they, they yeah. aren't. You obviously have interest in UFO, paranormal type things. Do you believe that Bigfoot is somehow, um, or, or has any paranormal um, powers. I know there's some things that have been talked about called the woo, where he's able to um, have you know telekinesis or he's able to vanish. What are your thoughts on, on kind of that? When we're dealing with the, the Bigfoot phenomenon and a lot of the cryptozoological mysteries, there's an elusivity here that is hard to explain. We should have bodies, but we don't. There may be techniques, things that we don't understand yet. We just have to keep documenting. But there appears to be a connection between various phenomena. And what I would say is that at times it appears that UFOs, uh, Bigfoot, uh, Thunderbird, uh, poltergeist outbreaks, all sorts of the the whole smorgasbord of paranormal phenomena, there seems to be a connectivity as if these are manifestations from the same source phenomena. And we're all looking for that source. I have read that some believe that uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch have um, paranormal or uh, superpowers. You're, now, you're really, doing it to me, aren't well, you? I, I have to ask you that because one, you're, you're into paranormal things, right. clearly. Right. And two, you heard something and then turned around and couldn't find a trail of anything. Right. So, I mean, what would you say, what, what would, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Uh, okay, so you're talking about the woo. That's what Bigfooters and people who are enthusiasts and interested in the subject 
That's known as the Wu. Okay. And the Wu encompasses anything that is not really physical evidence, like footprints in the ground, you know, castings. Right. Um, mind speak. Um, I don't know who said it, but paranormal is only paranormal because we don't understand it yet. Huh. You know, it's... Yeah. It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily something that is supernatural or, like, from beyond. Yeah. We just don't understand it. Right. Now you know the U.S. military invested millions of dollars into a project when they started using people to remote view. Yeah. And they spent millions of dollars on this project because it's it's real and it works. So we know that psychic abilities exist. So can Bigfoot's mind speak? I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Can they, can they affect how you feel when you're in their presence? I don't know if you guys were out in the audience when I was talking about the interview I did with a witch. Yeah, that was very interesting. And, you know, infrasound is known in the natural world. Tigers create it with a very low frequency in their growl, and it's designed to scare you. Yeah. It makes you freeze. Yeah. That, yeah. That's part of their hunting. You know, they, yeah. they get the, the, the prey to not move, and it yeah. becomes an easier target. Um, not necessarily saying that Sasquatch or Bigfoot use that to, because we're prey, but is more of a, an intimidation, I think, as more of a, an influence to get out of the area because that's where they are, that's, that's what they call home, right. possibly that's a, uh, a birthing area, you know, they have young ones there, I mean, who knows, but yeah, I think there is something to the to the woo, and hmm. you know, like you get the academics like Jeff Meldrum, and who's extremely well respected and has done a phenomenal job with, um, you know, the the foot casts and stuff like that, and even Cliff Barackman from Finding Bigfoot, they they rest on this wall of science. They lean against it pretty heavily because it is. It's easy to it's easy to back yourself up when you have proven science standing behind you. Mm -hmm. With the woo aspects of it, we can't really measure that. Mm -hmm. we, you know, telepathy, mental telepathy, to the telepathy doesn't leave a footprint right. in the in the right. ground. Something physical does. Um, so how do you measure that? And I don't think you can. So I think that's why they stay away from discussing that kind of stuff and you can't even really I've had personal conversations with both and you really can't even like get them off the record to talk about it because they don't have a basis to to stand behind it um, but I, I, you know it, it's always been one of the more interesting aspects of of Bigfootery to me yeah and and I think it is I think I think they have attributes you know, I guess I've said this before in some of my shows. Back when, back when we were living out on the plains mm -hmm. and there was a fire ring and we were sleeping around the fire in the open sky above us and we were sleeping with one eye open because we didn't know what kind of predator right. was going to come into the camp or somebody had to stay up all night yeah. to make sure that the other members of the tribe didn't get taken by a wild animal or some yeah. kind of predator. Um, that was a long time ago. We've had walls and ceilings and roofs and lockable doors and windows around us for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we've lost some of our senses. Mm. You know, not to say we had six, seven, eight, nine senses. I'm just saying the, the, uh, the, the acuteness of our senses have been dulled because we don't need them anymore. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if, if these things do exist, and I, and I believe they do, uh, if they're living out in the wild and they're having to 
You know, I mean, right. there's no evidence that these things are um, creating any kind of household structures. You know, there's there's nesting areas, there's other places that kind of give the impression of it might be some kind of a lodge, um, but they're not they're not structured housing. Right. You know, and there's no real evidence to show that these things are known to use um, anything more than maybe rudimentary tools. You know, we never hear about fires in the middle of the the woods where there's right. nobody at. You know, we don't know that they're using fire, so I imagine that they have to be relying on their senses way more than what we do right. and they quite honestly if, you know if you're walking into a, a wooded area and they're there they probably know way in advance right that that you're walking in they probably hear their car door slam you know yeah. from uh, a long long way and i've read a couple of papers that are talking about the the light sensitivity how how little bit of light over like a mile and a half away that they can recognize. Now, I don't know exactly how they know that, but um, I imagine it's all theories, but it's interesting stuff, yeah. no doubt about it. Some believe that Bigfoot kind of has um, very high intelligence, and even to an extent I've heard some believe it has supernatural powers. Do you believe that at all? I believe that in terms of intelligence, the natural intelligence, because if you're born and raised in the woods, that everything it does in the woods is natural to it, but because we don't live in the woods on a daily basis, that some of the things that it does are foreign to us, and it's just like, to them, it's perfectly natural. And to us, it's just like, oh, that's, if we were to observe that behavior, we'd say like, oh, that's probably a good way of going about life in the woods. Yeah. But in terms of supernatural or uh, those types of, Paranormal, I, I just don't understand how people latch onto it. Perhaps they're coming up with these ideas to explain the data. I think it's a cop out. There also is a little speculation that uh, Bigfoot has paranormal activity or paranormal um, powers. I've heard it referred to as the woo mm -hmm. before. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, what are, what are kind of your views on that? Sure. I think it can all be explained away, um, but I certainly don't want to discredit those who have had experiences like that. Uh, I just haven't seen any physical evidence to back that up. Um, if somebody came to me and showed me a picture of a Sasquatch coming out of a UFO, I certainly would be on board to investigate further. Um, but, you know, right now we have tangible physical evidence that points to this species being biological, and that's what I'm sticking to for now. I'm a very open-minded person. I have friends that are involved in paranormal, supernatural research. I have friends that are UFO investigators. I find all of it fascinating mm -hmm. and possible. Yeah. But with regard to Bigfoot, my own personal experience has been through 45 years of research interviewing hundreds of eyewitnesses is that only about three percent of the evidence would indicate any kind of supernatural origin or i've never experienced any high strangeness like that so in my own opinion that is really the result of a sort of a sociological or cultural phenomenon with regard to bigfoot and um not to be too verbose, but uh, there's a human thing called apophenia. It's a psychological condition that we all unconsciously demonstrate. And what apophenia is, is it's an unconscious need for us as humans to find meaningful connections between things that are sometimes unrelated. Yeah. And with regard to the supernatural and Bigfoot, they're both iconic mysteries yep. all over the world for centuries. And the way that our brains have evolved, some people find a, just this need to find that connection yeah. between Bigfoot and UFOs or Bigfoot and the supernatural. And, you know, many people are also very spiritual in nature. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of a confirmation bias with regard to Bigfoot because most of the people that I meet that think Bigfoot is supernatural are people that are already all in on the paranormal. Right. So they come from that background. That's what they're comfortable with and they want to sort of connect that to their own right. sort of experience. Would you say that potentially hunting or trying to find Bigfoot could be harmful to the species instead of letting it just kind of remain in its habitat? No, because if you take one, if you take one example out of the population, then you've gone from 
hundreds of years of collecting evidence to one data point that would go beyond evidence that would be proof. If someone were to get a body, then all the evidence accumulated saying like, oh, that evidence really was what we thought it was. And the specimen, this holotype, is the proof that all of these previous reports were for real. So I don't think taking one out would be a bad thing or it would affect the population. But then again, to be honest with you, I don't know. But that's not gonna stop a poacher from going to kill a deer or a bear or any other animal out there. Right. So it's not like even if there were laws on the books to, that said that you can't kill a Bigfoot, that's not gonna stop a poacher. Right. He's gonna go out and do what he wants to do. Right. So that argument in a sense to me is like non-existent. You know, you mentioned it's, it's natural reaction for when someone sees something like this, they, you know, the, the reaction is to become defensive, shoot at yep. it, whatever. Yep. Do you feel as if going out looking or hunting for Bigfoot is possibly destroying Bigfoot's habitat and maybe could prevent the race from, or the, or the no, being itself, no. or the species from growing? I just don't, you know, certainly we've had a, quite a bit of urbanization and it does take away from habitat, but it is surprising. Gabe is going to talk here another hour and he's found a surprising amount of habitat evidence of Bigfoot in the metro areas. Many of these big cities have swamps that are ideal uh, Bigfoot habitat. and. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people really hate it when they drive through the state land. Here's these clear cuts, which there's no question it's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> but the DNR does that to regenerate the growth because deer, birds, Bigfoot, everything survives on young growth. We, my wife and I actually live in a pine forest where there's 80 foot pine trees. And uh, the undergrowth is minimal. There's nothing, you know, deer wander through in the spring when they're really hungry and eat it, but there's really no f good forage there. It's good for the tree-dwelling birds and uh, like that, uh, or squirrels that eat pine cones, which many of them do, but and I'm not so sure Bigfoot doesn't either. But uh, clear, clear cuts, they're ugly, but you, Usually, if it's in decent ground in five years, you can't see through it. You can't do bird hunting. It's too thick. Hmm. And you look at the the new growth, you know, it'll be 10 foot tall and you can't see and you got all kinds of new growth and that's what Bigfoot eats. Yeah. They're herbivores. I mean, they eat everything. They eat animals too, but but uh, the herbivore feature of it, you, you wouldn't go, you couldn't find a better place for a Bigfoot. I often think I'm going to do more hiking and cut over yeah. areas that, you know, but I never get around. Usually when I get around to it, it's too hot and you can't mm. really bird hunt it. And uh, and uh, some of these really in good soils, you could have a whole family of Bigfoot laying out there. You wouldn't even know it. Nobody goes through it. No people go through it because you can't bird hunt. And it's really, in many cases, it's so thick. It's very difficult to walk in. Uh, my name is Brian Gosling. I'm, I'm a local here. Uh, I'm the police officer back in August of 1976 that had the up-close personal encounter out on Bear Road. After that fact, there was people older than me at the time because I was 24. Now I'm almost 72. That came forward and for a good month after the initial sighting on Bear Road, there were re reports on a certain road would be County Route 11 and Bear Road. Probably another dozen or so reports of people seeing things, stepping across fences you and I got to climb across. Uh, we, my wife and I wrote a book, it's called A Bear Road, The True Story, because the original story on documentaries and books that have been written is so far-fetched and so far out of whack, they've taken the main, the main purpose for the book we wrote is the facts because I'm the one that had the encounter, not everybody else. My words are my words not your words. That night, I mean, what were kind of your first impressions when you when you saw it? 
it. I mean, what was what 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 was first running through your mind? Now, I, I was the second night. I was off duty, my own car. The night before I was on duty, I couldn't leave the village unless I were in pursuit or backing up a call that the troopers or sheriffs couldn't cover. And the guys that come in just happened to be my brother and a friend of his. And my dad had just gotten off duty, it was midnight or so. And uh, they come in and told me, I thought they were full of kapui. And my encounter, the night I had my encounter, the trooper that was out there with me, he was on duty. He was probably 2,000 feet away from me or so, up on top of a hill, out in a field a little bit, 50 feet off the road, where I was 400 feet or so out in a field that hadn't been mowed that year by the farmers. My first, my first thought was, you gotta, you gotta live it with me because something told me to turn my spotlight on now. Something just told me to do it and right off the kitty corner of my car, Here's this creature standing there, seven and a half, eight foot tall, 400 pounds, maybe more, maybe a smidgen less, staring at me. And as soon as I brought, my, hit it with my spotlight, it brought his hands up like this, put his head back, and just let out such a deep guttural from the bottom to the top of the scale. And it lasted probably 10, 15 seconds. And at 30 feet, I guesstimated it was 30 feet, it was just like me blowing a tuba right directly in your face. I could feel it in my chest. Mm -hmm. I had my hand up, the hammer pulled back on the gun, and all I could hear in my head, believe it or not, is I'm not gonna hurt you, I'm not gonna hurt you. And while all this is going on, I'm standing there looking at something that don't exist. I didn't go out as a complete non-believer. Why should I just disbelieved my brother, his friend, my father was a sergeant here in Whitehall, two New York State troopers, two deputy sheriffs that all saw it. Mm -hmm. Why should I doubt them? But I went out for my own curiosity, and it's the trooper that went out with me, and he was on duty, went out for my own curiosity, and thank God I stayed where I did. <laughs> for months and months and months after that, we were all made fun of, and yeah, you know, and, and these same guys that are, uh, <laughs> made fun of me or some of the, not the, the festival, but different things we used to have in the park, whittling little Sasquatches and all that stuff, making money off it, see. And I embarrassed one guy so bad that the people that were buying things put them back down and walked away from the table. I said, there's one of the guys who used to make fun of me all the time and the rest of the family. But anyway, I'll never forget it. Right from the instance I left that road and got out in that field, the whole nine yards, I, it's etched up here forever. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, and I uh, thanks for telling your story. Tony, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. So what I'm on a hunt for is a, from a story about a devil monkey in Danville, New Hampshire, back in 2001. The story got dropped because the plane crashed in the, nine, the, the World Trade Centers, and the world forgot about it. So what I want to know is your professional opinion. Do you think that there's more than one type of ape or creature, um, for instance, a Sasquatch or a Sasquatch type creature with a tail. Do you believe, uh, do, you, do you think something like that exists? Uh, I think there's a, uh, a host of paranormal, if you want to call them entities or cryptozoological mysteries out there. There seems to be all sorts of different types of creatures, uh, some small, some large. Uh, Lauren Coleman, I think, had documented uh, nine different types of hominids or, or hominid type, bipedal type creatures. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if there's all sorts of different creatures out there that haven't been identified yet. Do you think they could have migrated from here in New York to eastern New England? Yeah, sure. There could be migration routes, but there may be something else going on that we just don't understand. We do know that they're looking at the data, there are certain times of the year, for instance, in the Whitehall area, that these creatures apparently are more populous in this region. Uh, August, September, and October seem to be the hot months. Now, we don't get a lot of reports on other months, but we do get reports for other months. In fact, Dan Gordon's, which was a high profile case, took place in February of 82. So, but yeah, there do seem to be areas that seem to be hot spots in certain times of the year. And that may be suggestive of migration, but there may be some other factor going in that we just don't consider. Not sure if you're familiar with the Danville Devil Monkey of 2001. A 
vaguely familiar with that. Okay. So. so what happened was, real quick in a nutshell, um, fire chief saw a monkey jump out of a tree, a big eight-foot monkey, jump back, the whole town, it was reported sightings, uh, law enforcement, media was all over it. As a matter of fact, a couple um, town employees were about to go on to the Today Show during the commercial break. Instead of cutting to that bit, they went to the, the, the planes crashing in the World Trade Center, so it was dropped. Um, so, so my thing is, I'm, well, if you're not familiar with it, um, I guess that's fine, because what we're, my connection was trying to find out where, if there's man apes coming down into southern New Hampshire, the east coast, they're going to be coming from the Adirondacks, right? I mean, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, I'm sure that uh, each state probably has a very small indigenous population okay. of them. Um, where um, some of the states, I can't say all of them. Uh, what I would be as a, a, an investigator and a professional investigator as well, I would, I would be very concerned about the description of what was seen, um, whether or not uh, perhaps somebody brought a primate. I would have to look at the primate laws in New Hampshire because I'm not sure. In New York State, it's illegal to own a primate. You have to have a zookeeper's license. So that makes it very difficult. Well, that was that. one of the things is, was it a wild, uh, a pet monkey that escaped? Nobody came to own it or claim it. And it just... The, what you got to understand, too, is that uh, a lot of these people will take these primates in as a baby. And then they get too, as they get older, they get harder to handle. So that may be just, we're just going to dump it off here and let it, let it be. Right, and let Mother right. Nature take care right. of it. You seem to do all your homework, check all the boxes. You, you check personal backgrounds too on the people making these claims. Um, and what would you say is the percentage of, of these sightings or hoaxes? Hoaxes, actual hoaxes, probably around 10%. Oh, only 10%. Right? Misidentifications okay. or uh, probably about 30 to 40%, even 50%. Um, and then 40%, and then probably about another 10 to 15 cent percent are kind of in the middle. You really can't determine where it lies on the spectrum. So probably the amount of RL encounter Bigfoot is probably about around 20, maybe 25 percent. Do you think there's just one species of Bigfoot or maybe a couple, no, a couple different? I, I, think, I think it's hard enough to prove one species that a unidentified primate is walking in the forest, let alone four or five or six. There's a, a number of uh, different you know, biological laws that would explain the differences in sizes and diversity amongst, you know, primates sure. itself. Sure, sure, so, sure. if it's a primate, it would fall kind of in the same diversity that we do or other primates will. Have you had any of your own sightings? I've had two. One in 2011, uh, and it was it was standing next to a utility pole, basically watching our campfire. And uh, I was the only one to see it because I was the only one to walk to my car to retrieve some batteries. And I shone my flashlight around, and there it was, standing next to the utility pole. It stayed there until I kind of shook the flashlight a little bit and walked off, got my other team out. They found it where it had walked into the forest. And while we're doing that, the, uh, the base camp had basically said they heard some movement oh, wow. going on there. Cool. This happened in the summer of 2015. I live near Boston. It happened in a town called Weston on Church Street. I've lived there my whole life, never saw it before, haven't seen it again. Driving over this small bridge over an abandoned railroad track, I was driving with my girlfriend at the time and my sister. Someone told me, look down. There it was, standing on the edge of the abandoned railroad tracks. It wasn't standing behind a tree or in the woods, it was right there. At least eight feet tall, 450 pounds. Just standing there watching that occasional car go over that bridge. Driving over the bridge, I said, you guys, did you see that? And they were too busy talking, two women. They're like, see what? I made a U-turn. We parked right there. We watched it for a good five minutes. Here's the most, <laughs> this is, I can't even talk because I get too excited about this. But here we go. This is how I know it wasn't a bear standing on two legs. And I know it wasn't a guy in a costume because here we go. I saw it plain as day. Again, it was about 75 feet away, down below us. And we're sitting in the safety of our car. My sister, to this day, said she saw a silhouette of it. And I hate to use the word blurry, but she saw like a blurry silhouette of the same thing that I saw perfectly. 
My girlfriend at the time didn't see it at all. We all had the same exact view. How do you explain that? Here we go. I've always believed. It shows itself to you if you believe in the thing, okay? My sister's always been right down the middle of the road. She kind of saw it, but she didn't see it. My girlfriend at that time never believed in ghosts, aliens, or Bigfoot. She didn't see it at all. Three different experiences with the same exact view. That fits like the perfect jigsaw puzzle piece, okay? So in other words, you could probably walk right by the thing unless you might smell it, okay? <laughs> you wouldn't even know it was there if you don't believe in it. Well, so. well, let me ask you this. So I grew up deer hunting, as you do in New England. And um, one of the things that I noticed when I would deer hunt is I would see things that I thought were a deer or bear or whatever, right. but it wasn't. Sure. So, I mean, you said, like, if, if you want it to see it, you'll see it. Or yeah. Yeah. do you think that sometimes maybe you think you see something because you want to see something. Well, I wasn't even looking for it. It's something just told me, look, as I drove over the bridge and it caught my eye. Again, it was like eight feet tall, 450 pounds, okay? So, like I say, it was weird. The whole thing was, it's life-changing when you have this kind of experience. And I know what I saw, and I can't say this enough, I don't do drugs, I wasn't drinking, and I'm not delusional. I'm a little out there, I've seen a lot of stuff in my life sometimes with people, sometimes by myself. But trust me, this was the most intense moment of my life, and I'm now I'm 63 years old. That it was the most intense five minutes of my entire life, and I've seen a lot of things and been a lot of places. But that is absolutely true story. Take it to the bank. And uh, at the time, were you convinced it was Bigfoot, or did you kind of have to think about it a little bit more? It was... 100% Bigfoot, man. I mean, it was the brown fur, dark brown face, longer arms. It wasn't jumping around, but you could see it was alive. It was just standing there. Like I say, it was just curious about that occasional car that was going over the bridge. Again, this was in the town of Weston, Massachusetts on Church Street. And now today, it's a very popular rail trail. And when I go over that bridge, what, I, what do I see? All day long, there's people jogging, running, rollerblading, but usually when the sun's going down, just the same time I saw it, there's usually a, a very young, pretty girl with headphones on by herself going down that rail trail. I would not be doing that if I was her. If she'd seen what I'd seen, I don't think so. Okay. Do you think, do you think Bigfoot would eat her? Like, do you think Big? Let me ask you this: Do you think Bigfoot is harmful? Is it just trying to let let us live our life? Is it trying to live its own life? That's a very good question. I think just like in the real world, there's good people and bad people, and I think this. I think some. Big feet, big foots, whatever you want to call them, are just curious and they don't mean you any harm. Whereas others, maybe not so much. Okay, I think this one was just just wanted to like see the cars. You know, it didn't mean any. It was just curious. It was just standing there like it had never seen cars before. And then, uh, do you think that Bigfoot has any like supernatural powers at all? Yeah, well, like, this the ability how I could see it and my girlfriend couldn't see it at all. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy, and I'm looking at her like she's crazy. It was like, how can you not see it? It's like right there. <laughs> it's like, so what are you gonna do? You know. Well, I appreciate you telling your story. Well, like I say, it was a pleasure. And like I say, also that summer, I learned so many years later, one of the Weston police saw the same thing on the other side of town in a swamp. Okay, so I saw it, and a cop saw it. So there you go. Take it to the bank. <laughs> right up. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Who are a couple of maybe the, uh, if you will, Hall of Fame researchers on the Bigfoot topic? Um, I would say Dr. Jeff Meldrum is probably the top researcher. He is an anthropologist um, at the Idaho State University. And, you know, he's a real scientist that is studying Sasquatch and spreading awareness about this species. And so I really enjoy his work. Um, another amazing and iconic researcher would be Whitehall's own Paul Bartholomew. He wrote uh, the Monsters of the North Woods book, and it's uh, all sightings and encounters of Sasquatch in the area. Paul Bartholomew is an amazing researcher. He has quite the collection. I've actually been to his personal library and oh my gosh, it blew me away. This man has so much knowledge and he's worked so hard to collect evidence and uh, knowledge on the subject. Who would you say are some uh, credible sources and uh, people that have really searched out knowledge about Bigfoot and really researched this that if someone who is new to the belief of Bigfoot or the study of Bigfoot 
who are some people that you would recommend um, to maybe study their work and to, to view some of the things that they've done? The Bigfoot phenomena actually has a lot of academics now involved that years ago it was pretty much Dr. Cook from Castleton and Dr. Grover Krantz from Washington State. But now, we, you know, there's Jeff Meldrum. Uh, in terms of researchers, uh, I corresponded with Rene DeHendon years ago, and of course we just lost Peter Byrne recently. So, I mean, they, we've got a lot of researchers that spent a lot of time documenting. But there's still a lot of people out there like uh, Lauren Coleman at the Cryptozoology International Museum in, uh, in Maine. Uh, he's done scores of years of research into this phenomena. There's probably not too many people more knowledgeable. Cliff Berkman, uh, Dr. Meldrum, and, and uh, uh, Lauren Coleman have probably seen more castings and physical evidence for these creatures than anybody else. Um, uh, Seth Breedlove with the Small Town Monsters has done a lot of great research with this stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of researchers out there and I think we're in pretty good hands. Well, this is, uh, this is a cast from 1984, 1982, 1984, Grace Harbor, Washington, and uh, 17 and a half inches, I believe, from the radius of the heel to the tip of the index toe. And uh, this, this is out of uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum's um, cast collection. It's a second generation of it. And it is, if I, I might be mistaken, but I think it's one of the larger track ways that is, have been found. I think there were somewhere in the neighborhood of two or three hundred footprints in a row yeah. where these casts were taken. I actually have uh, I have a cast of each foot, one of the left and one of the right, from do, two different individuals. But um, those casts are the same the same individual left that track. You yeah, got, you got left and right, left and yeah. right. Um, so it, it's just kind of neat to have a, a part of uh, history. Yeah. You know, th this yeah. cast was was created off of an original yeah. that came out of the ground. So uh, it's, cool. it's, a, it's a nice conversation piece. I like to have it at my oh, table yeah. for events like this. Yeah. And people just, they always, just, they just want to yeah, rub their like, fingers yeah, over yeah. it and say, you know, man, that, that's huge. So. People have a big foot fetish. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Weird people have foot fetishes, um, <laughs> big or small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't think I could identify one moment, but I could identify with the PG film, which I was fascinated by, the Patterson-Gimlin film, not just watching it many times, but after René de Hinden died in 2001, there was a lot more study on the film by Bill Munns and some other people and some other studies that actually freelancers that have posted stuff up on YouTube that are making these points about the subject in the film and it just all the information I'm seeing it just it just it made me completely sold on the idea that the PG film is a hundred percent real and if the PG film is real then Bigfoot is out there by process of deduction so it wasn't just one thing because I mean if I were out in the woods and saw a very good trackway I, w I would be sold on it but that's never happened yeah the trackway I've seen were degraded by rain and possibly a couple of days so they weren't the best tracks but they were tracks but I think if I saw tracks really good tracks I would have been 100% sold or a close-up sighting 100% sold but I've never seen one so I don't know I don't know in the sense that well I'm confident they're out there but it's just like I would like to see one I haven't but you know seeing one would be again it would reinforce your idea that you already have <laughs> Ken Gerard is a widely recognized. Oh, it's Gerhard. Ger oh, dude, Phil lied to us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, I had one question how to pronounce. I appreciate that, though. Gerhard. It makes it. That's. Phil lied to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> Phil's a good guy. He's a little confused sometimes. So. Just a little bit, yeah. Okay.